thank you for joining us tonight at the SPNN studios for this panel discussion to end human and sex trafficking in Minnesota. This topic is of great importance to the Twin Cities as we prepare to welcome hundreds of thousands of visitors who will be attending the upcoming NFL Super Bowl and week-long festivities. However, human trafficking uh, for sex is not a one-time occurrence, and it is an ongoing problem uh, for both young men and women at risk for being victims of abduction and then trafficked both here in our city, throughout the country, and throughout the world. We hope tonight that you will learn how to prevent the trafficking of our children, teens, and young adults. We hope that you'll advocate for stronger laws that can assist our law enforcement in saving victims and arresting perpetrators. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Minneapolis, I would like to thank the St. Paul League of Women Voters who organized this program uh, and they really led this effort. And this is the first time that Minneapolis and St. Paul League have done a joint project together for quite a number of years. So we're delighted that they invited us to partner with them. And we'd like to thank Vicki Barnes, who's Vice President of the League of Women Voters St. Paul, for her leadership um, in organizing this event. Erin Heisler for her help with communications and social media. Amy Mino, president of the St. Paul League, for her support and for helping moderate tonight's discussion. My colleague, Pam Tallin of the Minneapolis League of Women Voters. Steve Brunswick, who's hosting the studio and is the producer, and we couldn't have done this show without him. And Martin Ludden, the executive director of SPNN. On your, uh, every other seat, you'll see an index card like this. This is to write questions for our panel. So. Uh, feel free to put, and we'll be collecting them, I think, throughout the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Martin Ludden, the Executive Director of SPNN Studios. <clears throat> Thanks, everybody, and welcome to SPNN, um, and welcome to everybody who's watching across the metro. Tonight, we have, I'll say, a little bit of unprecedented um, cooperation between the media centers in the Twin Cities and we're being broadcast on Town Square TV, CTV North Suburbs, Burnsville League and Community TV, Suburban Cable Channels, and MTN in Minneapolis. Also like to say a big thank you to The Uptake for live streaming tonight, and to all of our partner community media centers who are sharing this throughout the metro. We are hosting this event both as a community media center and a place where you all can sit and where we can film this and broadcast it, but also as a place that serves vulnerable populations and vulnerable populations are at most risk for trafficking. So thank you for coming here to advocate on their behalf and to work to find a solution to this. We also have as our mission storytelling, and this is a story that needs to be told, and there's a light that needs to be shown on this. So thank you for your efforts on that, and thank you for being here and for tuning in across the metro and on social media. We are happy to have you here at SPNN. Thanks. Hi, I'm Amy Mino. I'm the president of the St. Paul League of Women Voters, and I just want to add my welcome to everyone who's here to listen to this very important topic, and also to um, add our thanks to um, Sandy from the uh, League of Women Voters of Minneapolis and Pam, who helped us put this together, and also a special thanks to Steve Brunsberg from SBNN, who has met with us from the beginning and uh, has uh, suffered through a lot of email chains and a lot of information and um, have helped us put this program together today. Senator Amy Klobuchar could not be here today, but she's done a lot of really good work on this issue. And um, despite the fact that she can't be here, she sent along a video that we are going to play for you that talks about the work that she has done. So I will ask for that to be played. Hello to everyone gathered for the panel discussion on fighting human trafficking in Minnesota. I think you know I'd much rather be there with you in person, but there's just a few things going on right now, so I'm honored to join you via video. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for making this important event possible, all the panelists for sharing their expertise, and everyone attending for coming to learn about how to bring justice to trafficking victims. As you all know, Millions of people around the world fall victim to trafficking every year. This doesn't just happen in faraway places, it also happens here at home. A few years ago, in Rochester, a 12-year-old girl got a text message to go to a party. A man picked her up in a parking lot and then raped her. 
She ended up in a hotel in the Twin Cities and was forced to take explicit pictures of herself. Then she was sold on the internet to two more men. Now they got that guy. That was a bad guy. Our Justice Department went after him. The U.S. Attorney in Minnesota handled the case himself. The guy was convicted by a jury and in 2016 he was sentenced to 33 years in federal prison. Horrifying stories like this are why I work with Senator John Cornyn of Texas, a Republican, to pass the Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act. Our bipartisan legislation tackles sex trafficking head-on by getting law enforcement resources and helping victims get their lives back on track. Since that law passed in 2015, law enforcement agencies at the local, state, and federal level working together have increased efforts to crack down on trafficking. And I made sure that it included our provision to help ensure that minors sold for sex are treated as victims, not criminals. It was modeled after Minnesota's Safe Harbor Law, which recognized that jail sentences are not what these children need. They need support. They need our help. And we're already working to build on this success. Last year, I introduced new legislation with Senator Cornyn and co-sponsored another bill with a bipartisan group of senators. Both would build on the progress we've made, and they passed the Senate in September, and one of them has been signed into law. That's the Truckers Against Trafficking bill. Uh, I've been working with truckers who are often the first line of defense against human trafficking. This month, as I said, the two bills that I did with Senator Thune to help prevent trafficking were signed into law. They help empower our drivers to prevent these heinous crimes we're seeing too often in Minnesota and around the country. Of course, there's still work to do. That's why events like these are so important. We've been a leader on this issue. We need that to continue. And I think the understanding is, yes, you have to have the laws in the books. You have to get the resources to enforce them. You have to have that coordination at the law enforcement level, like what we're seeing in preparation for the Super Bowl. But you also have to have uh, the private sector and the nonprofits working together to try to spot this. That's what I've learned from the flight attendants. That's what I've learned from our truckers. And I want to leave you with a story to show just how important your help is. Three years ago, I led a trip on human trafficking to Mexico City with Cindy McCain, the wife of John McCain, my colleague who's having such a tarp health problems right now, and Senator Heidi Heitkamp. The trip focused on how U.S. and Mexico can work together to combat human trafficking. One of the most memorable moments was visiting a shelter and meeting a young sex trafficking victim named Paloma. Her name means dove in Spanish. Unlike the other girls in this shelter, Paloma wouldn't speak to us. She would only cry. As I sat there looking at her and those tears rolling down her cheeks, it reminded me of what a Syrian refugee in Jordan had once told me that once she had seen in her lifetime, the horror she had witnessed would make, quote, stones cry. Through Paloma's silence, I know that that's what she was telling us too. Of course, we all understand that silence. What she's witnessed and what millions like her have witnessed would make stones cry. But the rest of us can't afford to be silent. We have to speak out. It will take nonprofits, businesses, and public officials. It will take all of us, all the time, giving all we have to give. Because these women and girls, and boys too, those close to home, those in faraway lands, have the right to be free. They have the right to live full, healthy, and happy lives. Let us never forget it. Let us never stop working towards that. So thank you for coming today, committing yourself to helping fight human trafficking, and working to make our state and the world a better place. Um, just want to thank Senator Klobuchar for taking um, the time to um, talk to us and the time to um, be involved in this issue. Um, like she says, uh, the Super Bowl, of course, has brought this front and center, but this is uh, an issue in our society that is uh, often hidden. and. Um, even after the Super Bowl, it's something that we need to work on um, and address in our society to try to end it. So again, thank you for coming um, to be part of that. So just a couple of logistics tonight uh, for our program. Uh, there are programs on your, on your chairs and uh, there are bios of our, uh, our panelists on that sheet of paper. So take a look at that because I'm going to um, announce the panel but just tell you their names and, and who they're with. Um, we are going to start out, uh, Ramsey County Attorney John Choi is going to um, 
have a, he has a presentation to share with us that'll be about 20 minutes long, and then we're going to go uh, call the panel up at that time and then um, get into discussion. There are cards on your chairs for you to write questions on, and if anyone needs a writing instrument, and please flag us down, uh, the league members will be on the sides, uh, will be collecting the questions. So raise your card when you have a question for us, and then we can take it and help uh, bring those up to um, John Choi, who will be um, fielding the questions to our panel. Okay. Um, so um, with that, I would like to introduce John Choi, um, our Ramsey County attorney since taking office in 2011. He has become a national leader in the fight against sex trafficking. Both as a St. Paul City attorney and in his current role as a county attorney, John's innovative approach to holding abusers accountable while working collaboratively with advocacy agencies to help victims has transformed the way government intervenes in domestic violence and sex trafficking situations. So we thank him for his work and I invite him to come up. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. It's really great to see in the audience, and I know that there's a lot of people in their living rooms and their kitchens who are watching this, but just great to see all of you here taking the time um, to learn more about this issue because it truly does take a community if we truly want to end really the buying and selling of vulnerable people and oftentimes children. Um, it takes a community, not just heroic police officers or victim advocates, prosecutors, it's actually all of us. And so it's just really heartening to, for me to see um, all of you here in the audience and I wanna thank uh, the League of Women Voters, St. Paul and Minneapolis, both of them coming together and putting together the resources um, uh, to have this event and also SPNN uh, for their work in um, bringing, making this possible because this is truly an important issue. So when I um, talk about this issue of sex trafficking here in Minnesota, I always start out with um, a photo of an assembly line. And the reason why I do that is I want you to understand kind of, kind of what our system is in terms of how we kind of respond to problems. You know, we're a complaint-based system. So as a society, when there are problems, if people raise their hand, right, so it oftentimes from a law enforcement perspective, someone has to call 911, right? And then if you do, then somebody responds and we do the best that we can to try to address those issues, right? But oftentimes when we're talking about the victims of sexual violence, and this is what this is, and those who are being trafficked, they may not really fully understand that they are a victim, or they may not want to talk about what's happening to them. Because who in this room wants to talk about their last traumatic or sexual experience that may have occurred? Nobody wants to do that. And so there are all of these cultural and other things that surround victims around uh, what happens. But the key is, and why we have made such great progress here in the state of Minnesota is because we've recognized just because you're not on the assembly line doesn't mean that this problem doesn't exist. In fact, when I first started talking about this issue back in uh, January of 2011 after taking office, I talked to a lot of my colleagues around the state and they said, John, I don't think we have this problem because we don't see these cases. But if you listen to the victims and survivors and the and the uh, police officers who are on the ground floor working with runaways and working uh, with um, exploited youth, um, they saw it every day. And so for me, it's been a real honor and privilege to be able to bring kind of light to this issue. And so what we're talking about, and I have some data uh, from the Department of Justice, and this is 2010 data. We don't have a, we're starting to develop a lot more data points around this issue. But what I want everybody to focus on is the, the number at the lower left-hand corner, uh, which is the percentage of children that are caught up in all of this, and those are under, under the age of 18. And I would say that that number is accurate here in the state of Minnesota, where 40% of those who are bought and sold who are uh, in these types of situations are oftentimes children. And I'll talk a lot about uh, why that is, but again, this is all about vulnerability. Um, it's estimated that in this country about 100,000 kids are trafficked uh, every year. 
And the average age of entry of first being prostituted is 13, 12 to 14 years of age, 13 years of age. So think about that. That's the seventh grade, right? And oftentimes, um, a lot of the victims that we encounter, and you'll hear from some of the advocates, you know, they're coming to us uh, in a really bad situation, bad uh, life circumstance, and also oftentimes because of all of this trauma, you know, they're thinking about killing themselves. And so that's a common thing, and so life expectancy is less for a lot of the victims that uh, we encounter. And um, all of this is, um, the vast majority of it is, you know, in the context of in these traffickers, uh, they know exactly what they're looking for. They're looking for vulnerable people. And if you think about it, if you're someone under the age of 18, you're 16, let's say, you've run away from home, you have maybe some mental health issues, addiction, emotional health issues, those are layers of vulnerability that just stack up on top of one another and make for that perfect situation uh, for bad people, traffickers in our community to take advantage of that. And that's what we see play out over and over again. The marketplace uh, for all of this uh, is on uh, the internet. Um, we still have our geographic locations like street corners and some corners of uh, Minneapolis like on Lake Street, but the vast, vast majority of all of this has really moved uh, on the internet where the marketplace is, where the buying and selling occurs of uh, trafficked uh, individuals. And the, the one particular website that is used the most often is a website called Backpage.com. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but it's what it is is an internet classified site. And um, that's where a lot of these ads will pop up. But one of the things that has happened recently is that very committed uh, leaders like Senator Klobuchar in Congress, uh, Representative Eric Paulson, and many, many other congressional leaders and also a very special sheriff in uh, Cook County, Illinois, uh, Sheriff Dart, uh, put a lot of pressure on Backpage to um, tell them, and, and here in Minnesota, lots of law enforcement leaders and prosecutors were saying that this site is, you're on notice that this is a platform for the trafficking of minors. And, uh, Senator Kamala Harris, when she was um, the Attorney General of California, also commenced uh, prosecution against Backpage. And so with all of that pressure, uh, what ended up happening is Backpage.com then took down their adult services section, because if you think about an internet classified site, it would be organized, right, in various sections. And there's, a, there's kind of like a dating adult uh, escort services section. And it's all broken down by geography. Uh, so they decided to take it down, uh, and also, too, the, uh, the Backpage owners were arrested. But the Backpage.com still exists. What's happened is that just some of the activity has just migrated uh, to other parts of Backpage. Now it's on the dating site, and there's other websites that are out there, but typically this is what's happening. But I think it's really important that we as a nation, we as a community, stood up to the proposition that Nobody is going to profit off of this. And so all of that political pressure and the legal pressure that was put on this company, I think, is really still important, even though it still exists uh, on this website. And also, too, I think if you talk to law enforcement uh, people, they will also tell you that there is one benefit of having some company that's venued here in our country. So imagine if these websites were in the Caribbean or someplace where we couldn't get access to some of these electronic records, that's how oftentimes the evidence that we put together to convict these traffickers, because you can't, if we can tra trace a bank account or a credit card or an ISP address, uh, it makes it much easier for us to prove the elements of uh, trafficking crime. Um, so sex trafficking in this country, and of course here in the state of Minnesota, it's driven by greed and money. It's a criminal, commercial enterprise. This is all about making money for the third party traffickers. And again, it's about finding and recruiting vulnerable people, oftentimes chick kids. And, and oftentimes the way this all plays out is it's because of that vulnerability, they know exactly what to do. I mean, they'll say, oh, you look so pretty, because maybe that's, or then provide some affection or some love, because that might be what is missing in a victim's life. And so the trafficker may provide that and pose as a caretaker or as a boyfriend. 
And then boom, the moment will happen where they say, well, if you really love me, you've been staying with me, these are the things that I need you to do. And so oftentimes that's how a common scenario that we see often happens. Um, and of course, this is about power and control. This is all about sexual violence. And, and I'm gonna talk a lot about it, all of this too, but none of this happens. All of this victimization of vulnerable people does not happen unless we have the demand. And that's what's driving all of this. And it's a conversation that we in this community need to have because those who are a part of that demand uh, it's a reflection from a demographic standpoint of all of us. And those are really, really critical, important conversations. So, um, and I also, also say that every community has vulnerable kids. Whenever I'm talking about this issue, this is not a St. Paul, Minneapolis metropolitan area issue. It's an issue that affects all of the state. In greater Minnesota, oftentimes a lot of our victims are vulnerable people who may have been tricked to getting on a bus and coming here uh, to my community here in Ramsey County. Um, and I think when we think about this issue of trafficking and victims, um, you've all seen the movie Pretty Woman, right? And I'm sure if somebody challenged me and said, John, there has to be somebody like Julia Roberts in America. Well, I would say that yes, there probably is, but it's like the apex of a triangle. Up here, yeah, you might find her. But the vast, vast majority of all of these situations involve vulnerable people who are being taken advantage of, oftentimes children, people who have run away from, children who have run away from home, people, uh, kids who might have addiction issues, emotional health, mental health issues, self-esteem, just all of those things, maybe even past sexual abuse in their systems, trauma. That is what it is. And oftentimes, um, um, it's a story about a girl who, who meets somebody online and gets tricked to coming here because there's something, uh, because just being a teenager, maybe lacking or wanting something different, gets tricked to coming on a bus here to St. Paul. And then she ends up realizing that the boyfriend that she thought she had online had a, actually another girlfriend, and they had a plan, and their plan was to trick her and to traffic her and force her to sleep with men in our community, 30 of them, in a one-week period here in this community. And she was so afraid that her life was going to be taken that she had a pair of sharp scissors behind her pillow, and she wrote a note to her mother apologizing for having run away because she thought she was going to die. That's the story that I'm going to play for you. I'm going to play a 911 call. And it's really hard to listen to this, but I want all of you to know what the reality of all of this is. And so I'm going to have that 911 audio played. <laughs> And I'm going to run away from Des Moines, Iowa, and I'm in big trouble. I know I'm afraid I'm about to get killed. All right, honey. No. Honey, I'm going to help you, okay? Yes. Are you at the, are you at the Hilton Garden Inn right now? Yes. How old are you, honey? I just turned 18. The people who are wanting to hurt me are just left. What, now you're fine? So I'm in the hotel room. Uh, which hotel room are you in, Barb? On, on the, t on, uh, 4 8 and on, um, room 850. 851, did they just leave? Yeah, but I'm afraid they're gonna come back. I'm gonna help you right now. You're gonna stay on the phone with me, yeah. and I will not hang up with you, okay? You mm -hmm. promise me? Yeah. Good girl. Now, who are those people? Do you know their names? Yeah, one's name is Tyree Eric Jones. Another one, I don't know her last name, but her name's Bianca. What's going on with them? Well, I, they sucked me in to come here, so I ran away from home. Mm -hmm. In the last couple of days, they've been threatening me and saying that I owe them money, and if I don't give them their money, they're going to kill me. And I, I hide appearances is under my pillow because I'm afraid that I need to defend myself. I don't want to be in the situation for anyone. Honey, honey, I'm going to help you, okay? I promise. No, I'm sending somebody there to come help you right now. Now, what, now the guy named Tyree, is he black? Yes, Tyree. Yeah, 
Minnesota. All right. And what is the, is the girl white, black, Mexican, Asian? The girl's black. Black female, what's her name? Bianca. And how old is Bianca, do you think? I think she's, uh, I think she said she was 23. 23? What's Bianca's last name? It says, I think it's me, Nicole or something, but she said she has a warrant here in Minnesota. Des Moines, Iowa? To come to Minnesota for what? Did they ever tell you? They told me I was supposed to make money and they've been making me see my guys, so now I'm afraid I have something. That's all right, honey. I'm going to send you a doctor too, okay? Okay. When does it start, sweetie? I don't. It's pretty. I was I came here last week on Wednesday. Now, is there anything I should know about, aside from what you've told me, sweetie? Is there any weapons in the room? Any drugs? I mean, any? I, like I said, I, would, I, I, I had a pair of scissors under my pillow because I'm afraid they're going to hurt me. What do you have under your pillow, honey? A pair of sharp scissors. All right. Well, the officers, the next knock you hear at your door will be the officers, and I'm going to stay on the phone with you the whole time, okay? So very hard to listen to, but that's what it is. And this is a common scenario that we see play out. And I'm so glad that we're able to better identify these situations, help our victims, and hold the sex traffickers, and also those who are contributing to the demand accountable in these types of situations. But one of the things, going back to when we started this conversation back in 2011, that needed to desperately change was that when we thought about that 17-year-old girl who turned 18 during the time that she was here in St. Paul. When she, as a 17-year-old, we thought of her as a criminal or somebody who else was engaged in the act of prostitution. And it wasn't for bad reason that oftentimes someone like Barb would end up in the back seat of a squad car and arrested and taken to detention. Oftentimes we believed or we thought that perhaps uh, she'll tell us who the traffickers are and maybe we need to protect her from the trafficker and so being in detention uh, might be helpful. But if you talk with survivors and as they look back on their ordeal, one of the things that they're really angry about is the fact that they were the ones that always ended up in jail and their traffickers and those who were contributing to the demand were never ever held accountable. So that wasn't necessarily working and what we really needed to do in the state of Minnesota was to think about it very differently, to recognize uh, that people in this situation are victims, that they're children in need of protection and that that's the mindset that everybody should have when we're interacting with um, those who have been prostituted. And so we made a dramatic change in February of 2011 as prosecutors to say that we would no longer prosecute children who had been prostituted because they weren't engaged in a crime. And instead, we would refocus our energy and effort around investigating and prosecuting the traffickers. And that served as the basis for our safe harbor law in 2011. And it's really great to be a Minnesotan because this is one of the few things that the legislature, if there's a bipartisan issue, this is it. Uh, and it's so great to see over the course of time that they have been adding uh, to uh, the Safe Harbor Bill because the Safe Harbor Bill just codified and put into law that you know if you're under the age of 18, that you're um, a child in need of protection and you're not to be considered a criminal or delinquent, right? And then, but you can't have a safe harbor unless you actually fund that safe harbor with shelter beds, right, and services in a way to think about how better to identify and investigate these crimes. And it's been so great to see how Minnesota has come together on a bipartisan basis uh, to really fund our safe harbor network and get shelter beds and then have a regional navigator system and through the Department of Health but when we started this conversation back in 2011, we had two shelter beds for trafficked youth across the state of Minnesota. Today, we have more than 50. And so we've made great, great progress around this area. And we've also recognized, because we listened to the voices of survivors, that something magical doesn't just happen when you're 18. 
if you're in this situation as a victim, you still need help and services. And so then the legislature took action uh, to say that these, the safe harbor funding and all of these services could be available uh, to people up to the age of 24, which if you think about it, that's the definition of how we define youth in our, in our community. And so all of those things the legislature has done has been really wonderful. And uh, today, in 2017, we have uh, reached the goal that we started with. We said what we really need to do to have a robust safe harbor system is $13. million in the base budgets in the Department of Health and in the Department of Human Services. And so just this past session, we reached that goal. And then, um, in addition to that, um, the legislatures have invested significant amounts of dollars for training and also to help investigative agencies, because I think as we were having this conversation, more and more police chiefs throughout the state started recognizing, yeah, this is happening in my community, and we wanted to investigate these crimes. And so we needed to have training around Safe Harbor and kind of what that all meant about looking at victims as victims and doing all these things differently. So uh, the legislature made an appropriation to the county attorney's office here in Ramsey to do a lot of the statewide training and also protocol development because just like St. Paul and Minneapolis League of Women Voters working together to pull all of you together, it's so critical around this issue that all of the law enforcement agencies and the prosecution offices are thinking are working together and now there's even greater efforts that are happening because now we have a statewide uh, investigators task force that is doing really great work and so I just really I think all of this stuff is really coming together and as you can see just from the standpoint of where we started back in 2020 and 2011 we've had significant increases in the prosecutions of traffickers and their convictions and then also too on the demand side um, we've been doing a lot of undercover uh, investigations oftentimes it's a, um, a police officer who would pose as someone who is a 13, 14, 15 year old victim. And sadly, throughout the state of Minnesota, there are men who want to buy that. And as you can see, those prosecutions have uh, also uh, increased significantly as well. Um, and also we've been getting great outcomes around some really lengthy sentences. This is the case involving uh, the Washington family on the east side of St. Paul. Uh, but there was uh, uh, two uncles and two nephews who were prosecuted and one of uh, the, the two younger individuals, defendants, uh, received sentences of over 40 years and we just recently had in the last two years uh, someone sentenced for 57 years. So clearly um, our judicial system is understanding the gravity of this crime and we're holding people accountable. But one of the things that I want to talk about though is about, because the title of why we're gathered here is we want to end this. You know, as a society, when we figure out that we've got problems and we can do better, we'll do it. And just like we did with domestic abuse, back in the 70s, a lot of times police officers would arise, arrive at a scene and might say that this is a private issue, maybe that the two could work it out and I'll come back tomorrow, stop doing that. But we've evolved so significantly. We recognize the crime that domestic violence is and the harm that it does not only uh, to the victim but also to the children involved and also our community. And so now we have different policies and better policies around, we have mandatory arrest policies, we have evidence-based prosecution, all of these advances. Uh, but the reality is we still have domestic violence, right? And so I think if we truly want to end it, we've got to think about some other things too not just responding, uh, but also thinking about prevention. So behind me is a picture of Target Field. We've all been there, most of us have been there, at least you know about it, it's where the Minnesota Twins play. I think the, the capacity of that stadium is about 40 some thousand people. But you know, we could fill that stadium up 17 times over. And that would represent all of the women and girls in the state of Minnesota who had at one point in their life been a victim of a sexual assault, domestic violence, or stalking. And I know that if we added sex trafficking, we could fill a few more sections of that stadium as well. But the vast, vast majority of the perpetrators of all of that victimization are men. And I say that as a man not to indict men, 
but as an invitation for all of us in this room and all of us watching on cable television, as an invitation for all of us to have a conversation about how we raise boys and to think about all of the things that drive all of this because those are the things that truly must change. And so in Ramsey County, uh, and so that swimming upstream and thinking about prevention and having these conversations within our families and within our communities and our schools, I think are just so, so critical. In Ramsey County, we've had a number of community conversations around this very topic. And it was just great to see the uh, audience participation and just the interest in wanting to talk about this issue because if we want to end all of this, then we need to think about how we actually prevent it and change our culture that surrounds uh, men to be wanting to engage in this type of criminal activity. And so I end with a picture of my two children, uh, Will and Nadia. They're a little bit older now. My oldest, Will, is nine years old. Um, and my daughter, Nadia, she's six. But if they represent boys and girls growing up in our community, um, I think the two of them are so linked. You know, I think if we can raise boys who are loving and respectful, I know that girls, just like Nadia, will grow up to be valued, respected, and safe. Thank you. As John's getting situated, I would just like to introduce our panel and ask them to come up. So, um, and, and John is going to give them each a chance to talk a little bit about what they do. So I'm just going to um, do a brief intro here. So we have Terry Ferlitti, uh, Executive Director of Breaking Free. Nicole Peterson, St. Paul Police Department and a Task Force Officer with the Minnesota Human Trafficking Investigators Task Force. Ed Heisler, co-executive director with Sarah Curtis of Men as Peacemakers, uh, MAP for short. And then Lorena Pinto uh, with the Family Partnership. She's the director of the Pride Program, promoting recovery, independence, digni dignity, and equality. So welcome, Pam. really admire the work uh, that these individuals do in their organizations and what they represent. And so maybe the first question is, I think it's really important for the audience to kind of know a little bit about kind of what brought you to this work, what you do, who you are. Um, so Terry, we'll start with you. Okay, my name is, my name is Terry Ferletti. I don't know if this is, oh, there we go. My name is Terry Ferletti. I'm the executive director for Breaking Free which is an organization here in St. Paul, we also have an office in Minneapolis, um, where we help women exit um, sex trafficking, prostitution. We have groups, we have three 18-unit um, housing um, facilities, which um, is one of the biggest barriers to escaping getting out of the life, is lack of housing. But housing in itself isn't the only answer. You need services and and whatnot. And then we also um, tackle the demand side. We have a John School in Minneapolis, which we are in St. Paul, that we hold every month. Um, so we work with men. I'm a survivor. I grew up in West Bloomington. My mother was a model. My father was a surgeon. My grandfather was a wildlife artist, Les Kuba. A lot of people knew of him. And the reason I'm saying this is, um, on one hand, I, I hate to shame my family and I'm not trying to do that because I love my family very much, but I want you to know that the vulnerabilities that we're talking about with sexual exploitation can hit at any age. It's not just youth. It's not just people with pre-existing conditions or maybe congenital anomalies. It could be you know, an FAS child, but what it is, it's people that have a lot of vulnerabilities. And, um, so, and it's not just disenfranchised folks, although disenfranchised folks have a higher rate of um, entry into prostitution because of um, lots of different factors, but um, 
just to say, I, I was didn't fit that mold. And I was raped by my boss when I was 15, and a lot of different things happened, and I ended up getting into the life a little bit later than most. So um, I don't want to go on, because I could. But um, so I'm going to pass it over, and um, so that's who I am and what I do, and that's what got me in the life. Nikki? I'm Nikki Peterson. Um, I am a sergeant with the St. Paul Police Department. I'm currently assigned to our human trafficking unit, and I'm also a member of the Minnesota Human Trafficking Investigators Task Force. Uh, we are housed out of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, and um, it's, it's a new task force, and it's a fantastic task force. Um, we have not only the local law enforcement representation from different agencies throughout the state, but we also have um, the state representation with the BCA, and we have um, the federal representation with Homeland Security. So we have all entities with, of law enforcement covered within our task force. Um, and then um, John Choi has been um, kind enough to provide a Ramsey County attorney who partners alongside of us to help us guide our investigations um, so that way we can make sure that we have the strongest case possible. Uh, I've been in with the St. Paul Police Department for the last 15 years or so, and I've been doing human trafficking investigations for the last two years. Previously, I was in our patrol division and also um, with domestic violence and in our special investigations unit. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Ed Heisler. I'm the co-executive director, uh, as was said, with Sarah Curtis uh, in Men as Peacemakers, uh, which is an organization that's based out of Duluth, Minnesota, but does work statewide and now nationally as well. Uh, and our mission focuses on uh, creating innovative uh, strategies to engage individuals and communities in promoting equality and preventing violence against women and children. Um, and so I feel pretty fortunate to be able to do that on a daily basis. Uh, the way that we specifically intersect with sex trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation um, is that there really was a lot of leadership coming out of the Twin Cities metro area, the Women's Foundation, uh, the various uh, tra trafficking task forces, and then in Duluth, uh, advocacy organizations had been dealing with the issue uh, for some time. And uh, back around 2011, 2012, they started talking with us about, well, let's start talking about ending demand and the role that, uh, that men can play in that. And they asked if we could start partnering to take a look at that. Um, and so what we did is we first partnered on, a, on an event, uh, just a way to bring men together to talk about the issue. Um, and as it turned out, over 200 men came to, that, came to that initial event. You can probably remember when sex trafficking started becoming a more mainstream sort of conversation, it was right around that time. And what we realized was we had a whole lot of men who wanted to do something, and we weren't exactly sure what to do with them. And we had a lot of questions like, how can we play a role in shaping the conversation around sex trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation, so that people see it as a form of oppression? And then how can we go beyond that so that men in our communities uh, can really be effective at partnering with uh, women and folks of all gender identities uh, in thinking about how to create the conditions to, uh, to end the demand for, for sex trafficking as a whole? Um, and so out of that has come what we call our Don't Buy It project, um, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Uh, but that's a specific effort to, um, to shape conversation and engage men uh, specifically around ending the demand for commercial sexual exploitation. Hi, my name is Lorena Pinto, and I'm a program director for the Pride program at the Family Partnership. And uh, at the Family Partnership, we work on various things. And one of those things we do is advocacy. Our Pride program has been um, in existence for over 40 years. We're the longest running program to help women exit the life of exploitation. And one of the unique things about the Pride program is that we work through the lifespan. And so that means that our youngest client is 12 years old and our oldest is, I believe, 66 plus. And that really kind of shapes and demonstrates what that life of recovery can look like and what some of those uh, misconceptions are around uh, healing and recovery for most of our clients. Uh, the work that I do, I've actually worked in the nonprofit sector for about over 15 years. I started working in empowering young girls and women um, at a very young age, around 19, and uh, traveled internationally to do this work in Lima, Peru, where I'm actually from. Um, when I came back to the States, I realized that I wanted to work domestically, because I realized this was a problem that was going on here in our backyard. 
Um, and, uh, and so I did and started doing that work in San Diego, California. And uh, that work brought me here to Minnesota, Minneapolis. Um, we do a lot of trainings nationally. And uh, one of the things that I learned about Minneapolis, unfortunately, was that they have a high prevalence and incidence of sex trafficking for minors. And when I thought about where I wanted to move and where I wanted to continue my impact, I thought about Minneapolis. And I, I'm glad I did. And now I've been here now at the Pride program for a little bit um, under a year. And uh, we do some amazing work. So thank you so for having me. So uh, Lorena, you talked a little bit about uh, misconceptions around the work that in the, in the issues that we deal with and the victims. So I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask all of the panelists about just some of the common misunderstandings that we see that we I think it's really important for the edu uh, the public to fully understand all of the nuance and things that may not seem so obvious, right? So Lorena, you want to talk about some of those that you would think are common that we see on a day, daily basis? Absolutely, and I think there's a few. I'm sure there'll be some repetitions along the way. Um, one of the ones that I mentioned in my introduction um, really goes along the recovery and what that looks like for our clients. And I think it's um, a misconception that most people think that once we quote unquote rescue a victim that that person can then be healed and that um, that trauma is gone and they continue to live a healthy, wonderful life. And that is quite a big misconception. A lot of our clients, it takes years, a lifelong um, work in recovery around mental health, chemical dependency, housing, uh, support and, fam and, and family supports around getting their kids back. And so what we see here is that it is very much a revolving door. Um, we know in domestic violence that it's most likely for women to exit a life of abuse. It takes about seven to eight times. That is very similar to the life of a woman in the life of prostitution. It takes them a while to realize that they are worth it and it takes a whole village of people to help them figure that out. And so I, I believe that to be one of the biggest misconceptions when working closely with survivors is you gotta be patient and you gotta know that that door is gonna revolve open and close many, many times. Um, but we wanna come in from a strength perspective and be open um, no matter how many times they walk in and out of that door. I guess one of the things that I'd say from my perspective, looking at it from a, from a prevention perspective and from the perspective of demand is that when we talk about misconceptions about how it looks, oftentimes um, when we are um, trying to change policy or, um, or laws, um, we're in a position of showing some of the most extreme cases of sex trafficking, some of the most violent situations that have existed. Um, and you know, it's hard to imagine ourselves uh, connected to what's happening uh, in those specific cases. Um, but when we look at how it's really happening on an everyday basis, um, it's connected to how as a community we really have a role to play in shaping a new normal. Um, because sex trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation, if you want a sense of what it looks like, it looks like everyday men um, who uh, grew up understanding that it was acceptable um, to go on Backpage.com to, to take a drive to find somebody to purchase. Um, it looks like everyday men going to hunting shacks, stopping at the strip club, um, because strip clubs are one of the you know, great ways that are, are feeders for sex trafficking, and, uh, and having that way of bonding with one another. Um, it looks like the bachelor parties where escort services are hired to bring people into, uh, into those bachelor parties. Um, people are bought, and uh, again, that's one way that trafficking sort of uh, works. It's also one of the interconnected ways that we as a community sort of allow for a normal where the value particularly of women and girls is, um, is mostly centered on their bodies. Um, and so uh, I think that the thing that I would say about the misconception is that it's important for us to respond with the horror that it deserves when there's these incredibly violent and um, extreme cases of sex trafficking that we see but we also need to understand that uh, we really need to undermine the everyday acceptance of using women for our, our profit and our pleasure um, uh, as something that's acceptable. Um, and instead seeing ourselves as interconnected uh, in our well-being and uh, standing up for the rights of, of everyone. Um, one of the misconceptions that I see often is that this is an inner city problem and that the, the victims are just inner city youth with you know, bad families and that's just not the case at all. Um, the, the, the victims that we see 
are all ages, all races, um, all, all sexes, and uh, the, but the one thing that they do have in common is vulnerability, as, as Terry alluded to earlier. But um, when you think about yourself even as a person, you've always, everyone has a vulnerability of one kind or another. And these traffickers are fantastic at figuring out what those vulnerabilities are. Um, especially young girls, you know, I think about myself when I was 13 years old and I can tell you I did not like myself. And if, if at the right moment someone, one of these traffickers came along, you know, it could be me on the other, other side there. And that's just something that I like to think about when I'm talking with these victims is that that, that could be me, that could be my daughters. You know, it's just, it's, it's a problem everywhere in our society. One of the misperceptions um, <coughs> that I run across, w uh, s w one on the man side, uh, the demand side, is we have a John School. And I attend the John School quite frequently. And what we do is we address the underlying attitudes and assumptions that men have uh, towards buying sex. All these Johns are not animals. They're not all monsters. And I'm a victim. Okay, and I'm going to say this because of Julia Roberts didn't do us any favors with that movie, Pretty Woman. I know women in the life that got into the life because of that woman. I know men that gave themselves permission to buy other women because of what Ed said, our society. They believe they have this privilege. But a lot of them believe that this is something mutual, that the woman is gaining just as much out of it as the man, and that is not true in 99.9% .9 of the cases. So, wh and why wouldn't they think that? We have to be nice to them because we have to come up with a certain amount of money every day, a quota. And we have to turn a certain number of tricks every day. So we're gonna make those men feel like we want them because if we don't come back with that money, we're gonna get beat or something's going to happen very bad. So that's one of the, the misconceptions. Although I will say there are monsters out there and um, sociopaths, um, but we're gonna continue to work on that, <laughs> the demand with education. One of the other things that you mentioned, and I'm glad you mentioned this, and uh, th the youngest client we ever had at Breaking Free was 10, and the oldest was 81. I went to court last week with somebody who was 61. So I wanna tell you, this isn't just youth, although we do need to look at the youth, like John said, and it is a problem, and we need to start there. We need to begin there so that we can, they don't end up being 35 and being trafficked like I was. So um, there's a lot of women on the streets to this, even today, and I'll tell you why a lot of us age out of Backpage, why um, some of us wouldn't, compete on Backpage. For, for one thing, I'm 56 right now. I can't compete on Backpage. If my picture was out there right now, who in their right mind would purchase me? Nobody would. Okay, so I will go to the streets. LBGTQ folks go to the streets. Um, and nat a lot of Native American folks go to the streets. And, and the reason Actually, between 10 and 20% of the people that come through Breaking Free, whether they're on social media or not, do work the streets still to this day. And it's because, for one thing, um, like LBGTQ folks, if they're posted on Backpage and somebody has an opportunity to look at that picture, determine, make a plan on how they're gonna oppress this person, what they're gonna do with that person, it's gonna give them, um, the vulnerability of something terrible happening is gonna increase. So a lot of folks will just go to the street, they'll jump in a car, they wanna turn their trick, they wanna get that money and, and get back home. Same with a lot of Native Americans. We know that another, who brought up Cook County? You did, okay, great. We know that last year in Cook County, of all the people that were arrested in 2016, 70% of the people trafficked said that they were recruited by family members. So we know family members is another big, um, something that we have to take a look at, is to change that generational curse and change generational happenings. Um, so I forgot what I was saying because I'm so old. Um, so I'm gonna just leave it at that. But t Terry, I, I think you're kind of talking about some of the next questions that I wanted to ask you. Okay. I mean, because I think you've got uh, the perspective of working with lots of victims. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about kind of elaborate more on kind of how 
our victims experience trafficking, like how they get into it and the tra- the trauma and some of the, the horrible things that they, they're subject to. Oh, yeah, and, and it really is very, very horrible. We just had somebody die a couple weeks ago. We, there's, a, there's a high um, rate of, of death, too. We have a candlelight vigil every year where we commemorate the people. But the majority of the girls that come through Breaking Free, I can only say this from the last 10 years of experience of all the women that come through, and I want to tell you, that's between 350 and 500 distinct people every year. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So we add what Lorena, how many people Lorena sees as well, and the other uh, victim service agencies. Um, there's a lot. But r- many of our women, over 80% of our women, were sexually abused before the age of 10 or 12. A lot of them in foster care, um, child protection, et cetera. So by the time they leave, you can't run away from home at five, six, seven years old. But you can run away from home at 10, 11, 12. I've got a 15-year-old right now, and I know she wouldn't make it a a day. So I just feel really bad about these folks. Perpetrators are more than likely going to find them. Um, They're going to um, start the lover boy strategy, which is used more often than not, posing as a boyfriend. And it could be two to three months with with buying them coach purses or Tory Burch clothes or whatever, something really, really nice that they couldn't afford because they're going to be sold over and over and over again. We in Minnesota, in the United States, the average number of tricks we have to turn in a day is between five and 10. In Southeast Asia, it can be up to 40. So, and there's a certain amount of money, but so the, the grooming process could, could take some time. And this is a common thing that, that uh, a perpetrator would do to one of us if he found us. Um, you know, we don't feel good about our bodies at 13. You know, I don't, not too many of us do, or, or w- you know, we're still in puberty. So we might meet a guy who's telling us our parents are horrible. If we have parents, we usually have just one, you know, parent in the household is the average profile of a victim and then they'll drive us around and maybe drive us up and down Lake Street and and see somebody who's being trapped and say what do you think about that person oh well I don't want anything to do with that that's prostitution I don't like it and the perpetrator will say something like oh well you know what I I think I I like that person I I'm really respect that person they're taking care of their business They're taking care of their family. They're doing what they need to do. They're out there on the streets taking care. So it's these subtle, uh, subtle messages that are played until the day that you're turned out. The day that you are turned out, something very, very, usually very, very violent happens to us um, where we could um, be raped by several different men at the same time. Almost always there is... um, uh, video of the event for blackmail purposes. Um, and it makes us feel like we don't want to live anymore and that we're not human because that human element has to be taken away. And then it would be the, uh, so it's the recruitment, the enslavement, and um, we don't leave because we feel that that's our only option. You know, it's not that we don't have choices. We have choices. I remember one day a guy told me, my, one of my pimps was, told me, he says, I want you to write these checks because we get involved in a lot of other crime as well. And I said, no, sir, I don't want to do that because that there's an audit trail and um, I'm going to get caught and I'm going to go to prison, whatever. He says, well, that's fine. Here's a room key. I want you to take these three guys, meet me at the Holiday Inn at 5 o'clock, and I'll come and pick you up. I said, where's that pen? Okay, so it's not, you know, these are the kinds of things that happen while you're in the life. And, um, gosh, I feel like I'm taking up too much time. So I want to give it, did, th- did that help? It did. And let's say, you know, the Family Partnership does a lot of amazing work. And so is there anything you want to add to that in terms of some of the work that um, you're doing with uh, our victims? And maybe you can also talk about the PRIDE program and some of the, uh, the, the approach to some of the great work that's happening there. Yes, um, there are a number of things that the PRIDE program is involved with. There are a number of things the PRIDE program is involved with. Um, one of the, what we do, like Terry, we have support groups, in-house support groups, and we also go out to correctional facilities, work with women who have actually been arrested, who are not receiving the support from those services and those um, institutions. And so we actually go out there and um, conduct support groups there as well. We do that as well with um, County Homeschool and JDC. So we want to make sure that we hit that prevention.
prevention, which is very, very important because um, we think about what really brings a youth into this type of lifestyle. And like everyone here talked about vulnerabilities, a lot of it has to do around healthy relationships, around boundaries, around red flags. And so these are the things that we talk about to youth um, to just raise that awareness of, of how important it is to know uh, that doesn't make me feel comfortable, and I'm going to express that, and how do I have these conversations? And so um, that's a really important key, especially here in the family partnership. Support groups, like I mentioned, um, we also do case management and advocacy, criminal justice. We have a, an advocate who works very closely with our women who have had prostitution charges, who have a lot of barriers in their lives to actually change some of that trajectory. So when they are arrested for prostitution, th that's a felony in most cases, right, here in Minnesota at least. And so there's a lot of barriers around housing, around employment that the, uh, our clients run into. So we want to make sure that we support them every which way that we possibly can um, because we know that that need is there. Uh, another thing that uh, we do is that we actually train um, communities. So we train both law enforcement, we train teachers, we train counselors, we train uh, ER uh, specialists, anyone that could possibly come in contact with youth that might think, I, I, I might be seeing something here. Um, some red flag, some feeling in my stomach is telling me that this is just not quite right. And so we give them that information. We let them know how they can contact us, let them know um, what conversations they need to be having. And if they want to bring us in, we can go ahead and actually meet with that youth or that person who's experiencing exploitation. And so we kind of counter it from very different ways at the Family Partnership, at the Pride Program. And like I said, we've actually been around for about 40 years. We were started by a survivor who used to meet with her counselor, her therapist at the Family Partnership. She was a survivor of sexual exploitation and trafficking. And because of that relationship, she realized that she knew that there were many women like her, friends of hers, that were out in the street that needed this type of service. So that group was started by them. So I think it's very unique in that way that, and to this day, we have survivor staff in there, um, and we provide mentorship as well to other young ladies who experienced it, young ladies, young boys, transgendered youth, and it happens across all genders, I should say that. Um, so one of the things that we do see is a, a lot of this is also word of mouth. So we have a lot of clients who have been in the streets for a very long time and in the lifestyle, and they themselves are coming in for some help, even if it's just for a bus pass or a bus token or a jacket or for a support group maybe that they need that particular week. And they'll bring somebody with them, and they'll say, you know, I, I'm receiving these services here at Pride, and these people understand me. And so we get to build that relationship through that network in the streets. Um, we also are, have very specialty courts with the uh, Hennepin County and the uh, city, uh, city of Minneapolis. So we're actually very in tune with what's happened to our clients on that criminal justice side, which I believe, again, is really important. So uh, we do a lot of little things, uh, a lot of big things at Pride, and I think, like Terry, um, one of the things that we see the most is women and, and girls who feel like they don't have a choice because the options that have been laid out for them are all really crappy. And when you have a slew of crappy choices, you're going to pick one of the least crappy choices that you have. And so it's not about a question of choice. It's a question of options. And if you don't have any options that are um, desirable, you might find yourself making a choice that you didn't want to make. And so we are there to support these women and these youth um, and these individuals through that recovery, which, again, takes a very long time for some of them. Thanks. So the next question I wanted to... Uh, have Nikki address, um, but we've had just, I think, a remarkable transformation in kind of law enforcement and prosecution, just the way that we're uh, handling these cases. I think like back in 2010, we relied on like heroic officers like uh, Grant Snyder or John Bannermer who did all this work, but they were kind of alone. But I feel like today there's just things have changed. There's more people like that, people like you who are, are, are doing this work, but there's just more of you throughout the state. So could you talk a little bit about that transformation? There absolutely is. There's um, quite a few investigators that um, just do trafficking cases. Uh, it used to be that St. Paul Police Department had the only um, vice unit in the state, and now there are several of us throughout the metro area, and, and we all partner together to tackle these cases because we know that trafficking cases don't just stay within the St. Paul boundaries. You know, these um, victims get uh, brought and and um, to different cities, so we have to work together. Uh, but one of the other changes that we've taken in law enforcement is a much more victim-centered approach. Um, my partners and I, you know, when we do meet with a victim for the first time, 
the first thing we do is make sure that their needs are met. Um, a lot of times, if they've, if especially if they're just coming out of the life, they have been demanded upon over and over and over, and, and they don't have their basic needs met. You know, do they have the clothes that they need right now? Are they dressed appropriately for the weather? Um, have they eaten? Have they slept? Um, just basic human needs that most of the time is not being met. So we do what we can to make sure that that they are having those needs met um, during our initial interview. And it, uh, and a lot of times we don't even conduct an interview the first time. We, we try to do what we can to build trust with them, to let them know that, that um, we are there to help them through this process, to guide them, to um, be someone that, that they can count on, um, and that someone that, that they can trust with telling their story to. Uh, and that's really an important thing for us to know that, or for them to know that uh, we are someone that, that they can trust. So, so Ed, I wanted to um, have you address this issue about, um, you know, I had alluded to the fact that I really believe we're never going to end this problem unless we start changing culture. And you're really one of my heroes because you've been working at this for such a long time about the culture that surrounds men that really important conversation about prevention, right? And so you want to talk a little bit about kind of the work that you've been doing? Yeah, and I know that you've got some uh, a video that you want to show and, and all that too. Sure, yeah, maybe we can start with the, with the video and then we'll talk a little bit about the Don't Buy It project. He told me he loved me, that I'd only have to strip for a little while and we'd start a new life together. Don't buy it. Guys act like being a real man means dominating women. Don't buy it. I'm sure she loves it and is making a lot of money. Don't buy it. They changed my name. I was thousands of miles away and sold for sex. Don't buy it. People are not products. Men are more than consumers. Learn more at don'tbuyitproject.org. So uh, that's one of the many PSAs that exist on our, on our website, um, which is don'tbuyitproject.org. But um, the Don't Buy It Project uh, has developed out of that work that I was talking about that came out of our, our community in Duluth, um, originally starting around 2011. Um, and it's been supported by the Women's Foundation um, over a long period of time to help it develop. And so. Um, that PSA, as you see images uh, behind us here of, of billboards and bus shelters and uh, all over media things and bathrooms and hallways and things like that, um, what we've got is an awareness raising campaign uh, that's happening right now uh, that is really focused on the message that uh, commercial sexual exploitation is an issue that men have a direct responsibility um, to address and that we are in the position to end the demand uh, for commercial sexual exploitation. Um, and as I said, we're sort of in that place where what we want to do is we want to uh, frame this issue as a form of oppression. And so understanding that people are not products uh, and men are a lot of great things in life. And one of the things that we shouldn't see ourselves as pri is, is as primarily consumers of, of other people for our own profit and our own, and our own pleasure. Um, and so this is just the first part of what we're doing uh, to try to raise awareness and ultimately engage men in ending the demand. Um, the idea right now, um, and through the Women's Foundation, this is one of the things that's been selected to be highlighted uh, around the Super Bowl. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to raise the awareness around the issue. Um, very soon in the next couple of weeks, we'll have an online uh, training module, a way that people can interact uh, in a in a really entertaining way to learn more about uh, the issue on a fundamental level and understand how men can start being a part of the solution. And then the third phase is actually uh, starting up our pilot sites uh, with uh, communities who have men who are interested in doing more. Um, and we've been developing a curriculum based out of the grassroots work that we've been doing with men um, in Duluth in order, in order to do that. Um, and I think that all of this is, is connected into this reality that um, it really takes an entire community to address the, the issue of commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking. We have got to take care of the harm that's done to victims. We have to hold people who are purchasing and exploiting um, accountable. Um, and uh, we need to create things like John schools so that, uh, so that we have interventions for the men who are purchasing and a clear understanding of the harm they're causing and the changes that they need to make. 
Um, and then I think a piece that's really important is that uh, every single one of us, and in particular speaking to everyday men, um, need to understand that we have a choice uh, to live in a way where we're reflecting sort of our interconnected well-being, our interdependence with one of us, with, with all of us, um, or if we're willing to um, tolerate a normal um, where it's okay to prey on vulnerable people and, uh, and exploit and use folks um, for our own pleasure. And so I think that's one of the things that's really exciting about being here in, in Minnesota is that we are a people who care a lot about the idea of, of freeze, freedom and about the idea of people's well-being. Um, and if we care about those things, one of the things that we have to realize is that, you know, my freedom is tied to your freedom, is tied to your freedom, is tied to your freedom. My well-being is tied to all of your well-beings. Um, and when we're in a position uh, where we see people as a collection of body parts, um, that is uh, very much a recipe uh, to justify harm to, to a lot of people in our communities. So we need to look at those beliefs and the ways that we're raising our young people um, to tolerate that normal uh, and change that, change the conditions so that, um, so that the tolerance for commercial sexual exploitation and sex trafficking doesn't exist in the first place. I'm trying to get some questions from the audience and I think people are using social media maybe or just the audience questions, but there's some questions, um, uh, questions about wanting to know a little bit more about John School, like how that comes to be and how does somebody get into John School and what are the, 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 what's the demographics of that? And uh, so maybe that's the first question. I think probably Terry would be the person to answer that. Yeah, and I'm a data head too, so I can tell you some stuff. Um, for the last uh, t over 10 years, we've had John School, and we primarily get referrals from St. Paul Police. We need more referrals because the number of Johns that we're seeing on a monthly basis is not nearly as many as we should. So if a man who uh, is caught in the act of sex trafficking, if it's not a minor, because like um, Lorena said, minors get felonies now. If it's not a minor and it's somebody who's purchased someone 18 and older, they come to our John School, which we hold once a month, and we're the only John School in the Twin City area. There's one in St. Cloud also. Um, so what we do is we have our city attorney, um, um, comes in, John Penland, and he talks to the, to the Johns. It's an eight-hour program. And then we have our women that have been vetted, that have gone through Speakers Bureau, that tell their story. They tell their story about what it really means to be in the life. We break down sex trafficking uh, for what it is. We talk about the power and control. Um, we have um, the Department of Health that comes in and talks about diseases that can be contracted, or maybe um, what some of the prominent diseases are that are going through the Twin Cities right now. We will let them know. We do free AIDS tests, things like that. We also have community members come in and talk about the fact that when I was taking care of my grandkids last week, I, I, I grabbed some gum out of my granddaughter's mouth and it was a used condom, which means people, Johns travel in the Twin Cities about 15 to 30 miles. Outside of the Twin Cities, it can be up to an hour before they um, purchase somebody. But they don't want to do it in their backyard, but they'll do it in the, in the city, you know? And then we have other speakers that come in. So it's to address the underlying assumptions and principles that men have while purchasing sex. And I do have some brochures on that table right outside the door that talks a little bit about the objectives um, and the outcomes that we want from John's school. Um, we do have some sex addicts, males, that have come in that have talked about their addiction. And we talk about different ways that if men really want to get out, out of this um, habit of buying women, where, where can they go? Because a lot of them have tried to use support groups like AA doesn't work. You know, it, it, it doesn't work. They're shunned, they don't feel comfortable. So that's one of the reasons Ed and I are gonna talk a little bit later about some things. Um, but we, that's, um, we hold the John School once a month. Over the last 10 years, out of 770 men that we've seen, I'm gonna give you the profile. The average man is a white male, 47 years old, is married, has children, at least one of them's a girl, has a bachelor's degree or higher, 
make $75,000 a year or more, but they come from all different um, careers and backgrounds, and um, doesn't have a criminal background. And they do not live in, the, in a 5510 something area or code or a 5540. So they're not inner city folks by their zip code. They're usually folks that live in suburbs. So that is real data from uh, just from Breaking Freeze John School. Now, that I can't say that that's across the country, but that's what, what our experience has been. And there's some other data that the University of Minnesota uh, that was funded by the Women's Foundation, Dr. Lauren Martin, um, uh, talked a little bit about the demographics, kind of matching kind of what our demographics are, but also that uh, oftentimes that the buying occurs during the day, during, during the work day, and many of these men are married. Okay, can I comment on that? Yeah. Okay, you're right. The average number of calls is about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's the time when a lot of calls are going to be made. That is not the time that the sex is going to happen. So that's a misconception. The sex is going to happen later or earlier. In fact, the m most common time that we met our tricks were between 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. on the way to work. Now, during the Super Bowl, we're going to be there after the bars close and all that, um, and they'll be open till 4 o'clock. So I don't know how how late bars stay open now but so we would do outreach um whatever two o'clock but yes you're right the calls and the the um the appointments are made during the day but the actual sex acts themselves are usually on the way to work or the way or after work and we're certainly not going to be turning tricks in parking lots of businesses like people think. That's a misconception. There's cameras. There's people walking around. Come on. You know, you're not trying to get caught in the back seat of a car. So that's another misconception. Another question that we're getting is how do we get the, the, the conversation um, about prevention in schools? Is it happening? Um, I don't know who best might answer that. Uh, Lorena, Ed? start it but I think definitely you probably have a lot more to say um, I would say that uh, it's an uphill battle with schools I think curriculum specifically that is centered around sex trafficking is hard to get through the door um, there are because of the misconceptions and fear I think around parents and and family members and teachers um, but I know that uh, despite all of that there are some very important folks working to get some of those things passed in fact a very a young lady approached me at, um, she is a high school student at Hopkins who is trying to push curriculum through her high school to talk about sex trafficking and prevention. She, I believe, is 17 years old and she is making some great strides. And so I think it takes one of us and one of our own youth who understand the impact, um, what's going on in her school and with her friends and her circle. So we are, we, I think that there are a lot of uh, moving pieces. The Super Bowl is definitely bringing a lot of awareness on this topic, which, um, I know I'm thankful for and, and, and that of other service providers are also thankful for. Um, but I think it takes, like I'd say, it takes a number of people and a whole group of us to really get that through. Um, schools are tough, I have to say that. They're tough to get through. Um, but one other thing we can do outside of that is after school programs. Um, you know, sometimes they go into interfaith, like faith communities and they also do like youth programs there as well. I know Cornerstone does some of that. So uh, I think overall the community is trying to uh, push that forward. For uh, Ed, did you want to say something about? It? Well, I, I was just going to agree with agree with that com com completely. I think that there's um, advocacy organizations and folks across the state who are working on you know different versions of curriculum that could be embedded in schools. I know Pavs in Duluth is doing that work. So support for that and a call for that is really important. Um, and then there's the reality of sort of thinking about how to use things like uh, the accepted the acceptance of maybe healthy healthy relationship topics and health classes and things like this to include um, elements of, of prevention of sexual exploitation um, into that as well. And then don't discount the stuff like, uh, like athletics. Um, how do we have conversations about how we um, build you know, um, healthy relationships, uh, sexual respect, things like that into our conversations that coaches are having with, uh, with students, into ex other extracurriculars? Um, and into the different 
into the different uh, places that, that, that we can have more access uh, in schools. And then partnered with that too is um, just awareness of how social media sites are being used as a recruiting tool for uh, these young girls especially, that, um, that parents need to be aware of how often uh, people are young, young people are being recruited off of social media sites and dating websites. It, it happens all the time. You know, Nikki, I think um, it'd be great to make sure that the audience and all the viewers truly understand like the amount of the demand that's out there. You've done some of, worked on some of these details where you might have posted an ad and tell us like how quickly, you know, the phone might start ringing and like how many calls you might get. Because I think that's just really important for all of us to understand that this, it's all being driven by the demand, but there's just a lot of it out there. This isn't just like a little bit of, you know, like 30 men in our community who are wanting to do this tonight. It's a lot, lot different than that. So Nick, you want to talk about that? Um, yeah, uh, on average when we post an ad on Backpage, um, our, uh, so we, we post an ad, um, a lot of times we do what we call guardian angel details, where we post an ad as if we're 18 years old, um, but then uh, once th we start conversations with the buyers, we let them know that we're actually 15 years old. Um, but initially they think that they are responding to an adult ad. Um, so as soon as we post an ad, we will have people calling and texting that number within a minute of that ad being posted. Uh, on average, uh, in about a six to seven hour day of a detail, we will have between 150 to 200 new numbers that will be calling and texting us. Um, and then uh, on average, if we're doing a guardian angel detail where we're um, posing as a 15-year-old, we have between six and 10 men showing up knowing that they are about to have sex with a 15-year-old and that they've agreed to a sex act and agreed to that sex act for an amount of money. So, so it's, it's really disturbing. When I first came into the unit, I, I mean, I'd been in law enforcement for several years and I knew that um, prostitution existed and I, I knew that um, it was out there, but it was jaw-dropping at how prolific it was. And then on the other side of it, when you're monitoring people who might be putting up the ads, I mean, how quickly does that back page, page refresh? Um, so as far as how back page works, you have to pay in order to get your ad to go to the top of the list. Um, and so we pay to get our ad to the top of the list, but um, it frequently will drop um, within, it, so we, we pay to refresh to go to the top every hour. So it will drop down to um, 20 lines down within that hour, oftentimes, depending upon the time of day, you know, later in the afternoon, as, as John alluded to, it does um, drop much faster than it, do than it does earlier in the day. So um, I think we've counted that there's usually around 200 ads um, that are posted in the metro area every day. So right around that, so. So I guess we have time for one more question. And maybe Ed, you could start this off because I know you've been um, working on this issue as well. But the question from this note is, how are strip joints an entry point to sex trafficking? Yeah, that's a good question. I think there's a couple of, um, a couple of answers to that. Uh, you know, one, and um, this isn't my, my primary area, but you know, maybe you can comment on this as well. I mean, um, I think it's very well documented that um, strip clubs are sort of used as part of a track for how people are um, moved around. So when we talk about commercial exploitation, whether you're talking about strip clubs or escort services or pornography or things like this, from a demand perspective, when we're speaking to everyday men, one of the questions that we're commonly posing is, how do you know the conditions that are existing around any of this, right? Like you walk into that strip club, you know, how do you know what sort of vulnerabilities are being leveraged in the way that that person is being um, exploited? Um, these, these things are all interconnected and part of, of, uh, of, of the system that allows for um, so many people to be bought and sold. Um, I think the other way that I'd answer that question specifically is that, um, you know, strip clubs are a legal way um, of, of um, exploiting um, largely women. So, uh, you know, when I was growing up in my hometown, uh, I remember very clearly when the internet started and the process of sort of, you know, looking at my first pornography pages and seeing women um, 
described by their, their race, their body parts, the sex acts that they were performing. That's what strip clubs are basically doing too, is creating um, those sort of conditions where you come in and pay for that. Um, and so it is not much of a leap to be participating in those more legalized forms of commercial sexual exploitation and move into the realm of um, actually purchasing a person from Backpage or from, uh, from other sources either. Can I just say that 30% of the women that came through Breaking Free were, f were introduced to sex trafficking via strip clubs? And it's usually between um, two days and seven days is the amount of time it takes before they have to start engaging in sex acts to make their money. So I think we're at the end of our questions, but I think we should give our panelists uh, a round of applause uh, for, the, for not just being here today, but just for the great work that they do and their organizations do day in and day out because all of you are truly making a difference. It's an honor for me to be a part of the work that all of you do. And I think that um, Amy and Sandy were gonna come up or somebody was gonna come up and close it up. Okay, um, thank you again uh, to our panelists, um, to John for helping moderate this and for a really good discussion. And um, just as a takeaway, um, I think it's pretty clear this, it, you know, this is a problem in our community and it's going to take everyone, um, all parties engaged, meaning um, the victims, the, the people who are um, looking for the services, uh, and those of us in the community to care enough to change things. So um, thank you for being here and being part of that. Um, and there we do have some resources um, if we can get that screen up. No, we don't have the screen. Okay, um, there are a couple of, of resources we're going to give you, and we will, um, we'll put these up on our websites too, um, the St. Paul League, lwvsp.org, and the um, Minneapolis League do you is um, lwvminneapolis.org, uh, uh, mpls.org. Um, so for more information, uh, the Safe Harbor for All, and it's a, it's a very long um, website address, so I'm not going to try to give it, but um, if you Google it, Safe Har Harbor for All, you'll be able to get it, or again on our websites. And then the State Human Trafficking Task Force website, um, which is mnhttf.org, so two very, very good resources. And then um, just to say, um, you know, Getting involved, uh, the League of Women Voters of Minneapolis and St. Paul both um, keep ongoing discussions on a lot of different topics and a lot of the topics that we do cover um, that maybe not directly related to this play into the vulnerabilities that our panel talked about earlier like affordable housing, stable communities. So League is always a great way to get involved and our membership materials are outside on the table and um, I encourage you to grab those and, and get involved and be part of this conversation so we can continue to do, to change it, to change the culture. So. And we'd like to also let you know that men are uh, eligible to become members of the League of Women Voters, and we welcome them to join us in, a, in our efforts. So I want to thank um, SBN and Studios today uh, for filming this, uh, our partner broadcasting studios uh, around the metro area, um, of course our, our panel and um, our volunteers that help put this together. So thank you all for joining us and, and coming in to our studio on a relatively uh, cold January day. And those that are in our viewing audience, thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon.